Hi, I'm Dr. Tom Kravis, Physician Executive for 3M Consulting Services. Thank you for joining me. Today we're going to talk about ICD-10 documentation for family medicine. There are some changes you will need to make in your documentation to support ICD-10, but there are instances of documentation that can remain the same. So take a deep breath, relax, and let's get started. I know you are busy in your clinical practice, so I will briefly summarize the key takeaways. In your documentation of patient care, consider the use of adjectives, link the cause and effect of each condition, be specific about aspects of disease, and each anatomical site, and use exact dates when appropriate. A little more on each of these. Differentiate in your notes whether or not a condition is acute, chronic, or acute on chronic whenever appropriate. For example, document acute on chronic congestive heart failure instead of congestive heart failure. Use due to or secondary to to indicate cause and effect and to record all conditions the patient may have such as acute systolic heart failure due to or secondary to hypertension or pharyngitis due to streptococcus group A. Think about the most current terminology to describe a condition or different aspects of the disease. For example, paroxysmal versus persistent atrial fibrillation or typical or type 1 versus typical or type 2 atrial flutter or systolic versus diastolic heart failure or both. Precisely designate anatomical sites such as deep vein thrombosis, identifying the specific vein in which the thrombosis is located and in which leg, left or right, and is it an acute or chronic DVT. Use exact dates when appropriate. For example, when a patient is admitted for acute myocardial infarction and the patient previously had a recent MI, document the exact date of the recent MI. Ask yourself what else could I include in my notes about this patient's condition that would better communicate how sick the patient is, which in turn better communicates the resources needed for patient care. Incorporating these aspects into your documentation will result in an accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality outcomes and it will help reduce the number of queries you receive to clarify your documentation. In the upcoming slides we'll take a look at some diseases and procedures that have new documentation requirements under ICD-10. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 continues to classify coronary artery disease by native coronary artery or bypass graft, and if the coronary artery disease is of a bypass graft, the type of graft. These should already be elements of your documentation. What's different in ICD-10? Combination codes are provided for CAD with and without angina. When your patient has CAD with angina, your documentation of angina should include the type if other than angina pectoris, such as unstable angina or angina with documented spasm. For example, ICD-10 code I25.710 is reported when you document CAD of a saphenous vein coronary artery bypass graft and unstable angina pectoris. As physicians, we know what the clinical term acute coronary syndrome means, but in ICD-10, acute coronary syndrome is assigned to the nonspecific diagnosis code of acute ischemic heart disease unspecified. If you can describe ACS more specifically as intermediate or insufficiency coronary syndrome, unstable angina, or coronary slow flow syndrome, these terms 
rather than ACS should be documented and will result in codes that give a more accurate picture of what you are treating. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 classifies myocardial infarction by type, STEMI versus non-STEMI. New in ICD-10 is the ability to report the site or location of a STEMI by coronary artery affected. If at the same time of diagnosis you don't know which coronary artery is involved, document the suspected or possible anatomic site such as the anterior or inferior wall of the heart affected. Note that no additional documentation is needed for the location of a non-STEMI. Here are some examples of ICD-10 codes for a STEMI. Note that the codes are first categorized by anterior or inferior wall, then additional specificity is provided for the coronary artery. Also note that certain terms crosswalk to certain other codes. For example, a transmural myocardial infarction of the interior wall is coded to other coronary artery. The key here is describing the MI as specifically as you can regarding the type and location in terms of the artery, wall, or other site affected. Unique ICD-10 codes are used to identify patients who present with an MI that is occurring within four weeks of a previous MI. When a patient is admitted with an MI and the patient has a history of a recent MI, document the date of the recent MI, the type as either STEMI or non-STEMI, and in the case of STEMI, the wall of the heart that is affected. We see here in this example of medical record documentation that the patient presented with an acute STEMI of the LMCA and the patient also had a history of non-STEMI last month. Improved documentation for ICD-10 includes either the exact date of the previous non-STEMI or the number of weeks since it occurred. ICD-10 terminology describing congestive heart failure remains essentially unchanged from ICD-9. However, there is currently an opportunity for improvement in documenting this diagnosis. To provide an accurate picture of the patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality, you should specify whether the patient's congestive heart failure is acute, chronic, or acute on chronic, and whether it is systolic, diastolic, or a combination of both. Additionally, you should document the cause or etiology of the congestive heart failure when known or suspected. An example of excellent documentation would be acute systolic heart failure due to possible or suspected alcoholic cardiomyopathy. What's different about the diagnosis code for hypertension in ICD-10 is that it is no longer classified as benign, malignant, or unspecified. Diagnoses of benign or malignant hypertension or hypertension with no further specificity are all coded the same. As an aside, the ICD-10 code for hypertension is one you will easily remember. It is I-10, as you can see on the screen. As in ICD-9, continue to document the relationship between hypertension and target organ disease, such as hypertensive heart disease or chronic kidney disease due to hypertension. The look and feel for codes describing diabetes has changed, but the level of detail describing the disease remains mostly the same. Therefore, your documentation doesn't need to change as long as you are currently documenting the type of diabetes as type 1 and type 2 and any associated complications, for example, diabetic peripheral angiopathy or diabetic autonomic neuropathy or diabetic foot ulcer. The good news is that ICD-10 uses single combination codes to describe the disease. ICD-9 usually required multiple codes. Take, for example, the diagnosis of 
type 2 diabetes with diabetic peripheral angiopathy with gangrene. This diagnosis required three codes in ICD-9, but in ICD-10, one combination code reports all of these. An additional code is assigned when you document that the patient's diabetes is poorly controlled or out of control. Given the health risks of obesity and the number of obese patients, it is important for us to be able to continue to track the prevalence and cause of obesity among U.S. adults and children. Since overeating is the number one cause of obesity, it should come as no surprise that ICD-10 has a new code for nutritional obesity or obesity due to excess calories. So consider incorporating nutritional obesity into your vocabulary when applicable. It's a few less words than obesity due to excess calories. If your patient has morbid obesity, also document if alveolar hypoventilation is present. ICD-10 has a single combination code for it. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 continues to classify obesity due to other causes such as due to drugs or endocrine disorders. There are no changes here. However, I mentioned BMI because it is used in studies to predict the likelihood of successful and effective joint replacement surgery and how well the patient may tolerate the procedure and recover after surgery. When you consider BMI an important patient characteristic, including this information in your notes will increase accurate and consistent reporting. New in ICD-10 is the ability to identify specific types of nutritional deficiency anemias. In ICD-9, different types of anemia were grouped under a generic code such as folate deficiency anemias. As you can see on screen, there are specific codes for the different types of iron, vitamin B12, folate, and other nutritional deficiency anemias such as vitamin B12 deficiency due to selective vitamin B12 malabsorption with proteinuria or drug-induced folate deficiency anemia. Therefore, it's important to detail the specific type of deficiency anemia in your notes. Remember that the coding professional cannot simply use and or interpret laboratory results, let's say an iron level or transferrin result, to assign a code for iron deficiency anemia. They are reliant on your documentation of the results and your diagnosis in order to assign a code. As I am sure most of you listening today may be aware, the diagnosis and management of acute otitis media has a significant impact on the health of children, the cost of providing care, and the overall use of antibiotics. The illness also generates a significant social burden and indirect cost due to time loss from school and work. The more specific we can be in reporting this diagnosis, the better the data will be that is used to quantify the impact on children, costs, burden on the health care system in general, and to determine efficacy of treatment. New to ICD-10, is the ability to capture recurrence in acute suppurative otitis media and acute non-suppurative otitis media. Take a few minutes to review on screen the types of otitis media that are separately identified in ICD-10 and the additional documentation for each that when provided will result in the reporting of an accurate description of the condition you are treating. Note that the terms you see such as acute chronic, recurrent, allergic, and serous, for example, must be documented by you in order to report these specific codes. The bad news is that while ICD-9 had a code that specifically described eustachian tube dysfunction, ICD-10 does not. Specific eustachian tube disorders described in ICD-10 are acute or chronic eustachian salpingitis, eustachian tube obstruction, further described as 
intrinsic or extrinsic, cartilaginous or osseous, and finally, patulous eustachian tube, the latter being admittedly somewhat rare. So, specify the cause of the eustachian tube dysfunction when known or suspected. Otherwise, eustachian tube dysfunction is reported with a code that states only other specified disorders of the eustachian tube. And don't forget the right, left, or bilateral. ICD-10 provides a new code, J30.0, that specifically identifies vasomotor rhinitis. Previously in ICD-9, a diagnosis of vasomotor rhinitis was classified to a code that stated allergic rhinitis unspecified cause. As in ICD-9, ICD-10 continues to classify rhinitis into three categories, acute, chronic, and allergic. The allergic category is now named vasomotor and allergic to accommodate the new code. Consider that the more specificity you document regarding the cause or etiology of the condition, the more likely the treatment and interventions that you plan will be affected and have good outcomes. Take for example a diagnosis documented as rhinitis versus a diagnosis documented as acute vasomotor rhinitis. Which clinical story is better? On screen, you see that code J31.0 for chronic rhinitis is reported when you documented only rhinitis. In this case, rhinitis defaults to chronic rhinitis versus J00 and J30.0 when you document acute vasomotor rhinitis. New in ICD-10 is the ability to report when documented when sinus is recurrent. Also, new codes that specifically describe acute or chronic pancytositis. What stays the same? As in ICD-9, sinusitis not otherwise described by you in the medical record is coded as chronic sinusitis. So, if your intended diagnosis is acute sinusitis, you must document acute. You should also document which specific sinus or sinuses are affected, because unique codes are reported for maxillary, frontal, ethmoidal, and sphenoidal. As previously mentioned, when your diagnosis is acute or chronic pansinusitis, a code can be assigned that says exactly that. ICD-10 provides combination codes to capture acute bronchitis due to eight different organisms. Document the specific organism causing the acute bronchitis when known or suspected by using due to or secondary to to indicate cause and effect. Note that you must document the word acute when your intended diagnosis is in fact acute bronchitis. Otherwise, a diagnosis of bronchitis is assigned to a code describing bronchitis not specified as acute or chronic. Chronic bronchitis has its own classification. If you can further specify the type of chronic bronchitis such as simple, mucopurulent, or both, a unique code describing the specific type will be reported. Classification of pneumonia and pneumonitis is very similar to ICD-9. It continues to be important for you to document the type of pneumonia, for example, aspiration pneumonia, and the organism, such as Klebsiella, when known or suspected. Remember, a coder cannot base code assignment on sputum culture or cytology reports. You must document the organism in your note, indicating a cause and effect relationship, such as Klebsiella pneumonia, or pneumonia secondary or due to Klebsiella. The classification of asthma is an example of the use of updated terminology in ICD-10. Asthma is now classified as mild, intermittent, or mild, moderate, or severe persistent. Documentation of acuity remains unchanged from ICD-9. You should continue to document the presence of an acute exacerbation or status asthmaticus.
For example, a diagnosis of severe persistent asthma with acute exacerbation is classified to J45.51. ICD-10 differentiates COPD with acute lower respiratory tract infection from acute exacerbation of COPD without infection. When an infection is present, document the specific infection and organism when known or suspected. When respiratory failure is present, it should be specified as acute, acute on chronic, or chronic. Dependence on the use of supplemental oxygen should also be indicated when applicable. Most types of emphysema were grouped into a single ICD-9 code. What's new in ICD-10? Separate codes are provided for specific types of emphysema. When you document the specific type of emphysema, when known or suspected, such as unilateral, panglobular, or centrolobular, a unique ICD-10 code for that condition can be reported. What's new with the codes for dental caries in ICD-10 is that they have undergone some revision and have been turned into combination codes. Dental caries is first categorized as being on the pit and fissure surface of the tooth or the smooth surface of the tooth. It is then further specified by the depth of disease progression into the tooth, either being limited to the enamel of the tooth, penetrating into the dentin, or penetrating into the pulp. So next time you are documenting a diagnosis of dental caries, please indicate the tooth surface and the depth of disease progression in order to avoid an unspecified dental caries code. Data on dental caries is collected as part of the National Oral Health Surveillance System, which is a subcomponent of the National Public Health Surveillance System. Oral public health initiatives can be designed appropriately when the data collected is accurate and specific. ICD-10 continues to specify abdominal pain, abdominal tenderness, and abdominal rigidity by anatomic location. All four quadrants epigastric and periumbilical as well as generalized. What's new is that ICD-10 provides specific codes for abdominal rebound tenderness by anatomic location. The takeaway here is to remember to document in your note the specific location of the abdomen for these symptoms. Providing a more specific symptom code will help support medical necessity for any diagnostic tests you may order in an effort to learn the cause of this common symptom. Once again, there is nothing much new here. Like ICD-9, ICD-10 can classify gastroenteritis due to a variety of causes or organisms when documented. Specify the etiology and or organism when known or suspected. Diagnoses such as gastroenteritis due to norovirus or suspect viral gastroenteritis convey more meaningful information than a diagnosis of gastroenteritis or a list of symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Document as much as you know or suspect about the gastroenteritis at the time of your evaluation. What's new with viral hepatitis in ICD-10 is that there are now codes to distinguish between acute and chronic hepatitis B and C. If you don't specify the chronicity of hepatitis B and C, a code for unspecified viral hepatitis must be assigned. Hepatitis A and E are only classified as acute in ICD-10. What remains the same in ICD-10 is that the type of hepatitis needs to be documented as well as hepatic coma if present. In addition, the findings of Delta agent in the hepatitis B patient should be documented as there are codes that indicate its presence with hepatitis B.
This helps to more accurately reflect the severity of illness and risk of mortality of your patients. Current medical literature classifies hemorrhoids into four stages or degrees. The distinction among these stages is clear and may affect your treatment. Consequently, ICD-10 has included this new terminology and defines the stages as you see on screen with the associated codes. Note that bleeding when present is included in the code for each grade or stage of hemorrhoid. However, the source of the bleeding should be clearly documented in your notes as due to hemorrhoids or due to some other known or suspected condition. You should no longer use the term internal or external in your patient care notes. You should document the stage or grade instead. Another code is assigned for perianal venous thrombosis when you document thrombosed hemorrhoid in addition to the grade or stage. There's not much new with urinary tract infections in ICD-10. If you know the site of the infection, it's an important to note it, such as cystitis, urethritis, or pyelonephritis. If the infection is related to a device, you must document this relationship, such as UTI due to indwelling hole. Lastly, if you know the organism causing the infection, make sure to document the cause and effect relationship in your notes, such as E. coli UTI. What's new with cystitis is that it is coded as either with or without hematuria. For example, on screen you see the code N30.01 is assigned when acute cystitis with hematuria is documented. You will also need to specify the type of cystitis, such as acute or interstitial, to name a few. Again, on screen, for example, you see that N30.10 is assigned for chronic interstitial cystitis without hematuria. Lastly, indicate if there is any known or suspected organism causing the cystitis. There is not much change in the documentation requirements from ICD-9 to ICD-10 for breast disorders, with a few exceptions. Laterality has been included for some of the breast disorders as well as for neoplasms of breast tissue. Several signs and symptoms now have their own specific code. As you can see on screen, there are now codes for breast induration, nipple discharge, and nipple retraction. In ICD-9, these conditions were signed the generic code of 611.79, Other Disorders of Breast. The increased specificity of the ICD-10 codes for these conditions may assist in supporting the medical necessity of diagnostic evaluation for breast imaging, for example. What's new with the code for excessive and frequent menstruation is that it is now specified as with a regular menstrual cycle or with an irregular menstrual cycle. The coding professional is dependent on your documentation of the regularity of the menstrual cycle in order to assign one of these two codes. Additionally, it is important to indicate in your documentation whether this bleeding is occurring at puberty, during the perimenopausal period, or in the postmenopausal period time frame since there are separate codes for excessive or frequent menstruation at each of these time frames. All types of epilepsy are classified as intractable or not intractable and with or without status epilepticus. Then, specific codes are provided to distinguish between localization, related idiopathic or localization related symptomatic epilepsy, and whether with simple, partial, or complex partial seizures. And generalized idiopathic, absence epileptic, and juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. Codes are also provided to report epilepsy undetermined 
as to whether focal or generalized epileptic seizures of external causes such as alcohol, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, and epileptic spasms. We hope that with all the detail provided in ICD-10, to see less of the code which describes unspecified epilepsy. As seen here, ICD-10 has five groups of codes for osteoarthritis. The first group is polyosteoarthritis that requires only documentation of the type such as primary generalized polyosteoarthritis. The next three groups of codes are specific to site affected hip, knee, and the first CMC joint. Unique codes can be reported for these sites to indicate the type as primary, post-traumatic, other secondary, and whether the right or left side or both is affected. The final group of codes classifies other types of OA that is not polyosteoarthritis or is not of the hip, knee, or of the first CMC joint. Unique codes that include laterality are provided for shoulder, elbow, wrist, hand, and ankle and foot. So think about the importance of documenting the clinical findings to support your final diagnosis, such as osteoarthritis or post-traumatic osteoarthritis of the left wrist. Obviously, the latter tells the better story. As physicians are increasingly held accountable for patient outcomes, a huge concern is how to classify the patient who fails to follow a recommended regimen of care and gets sicker as a result. Under ICD-9, there is only one generic code for such a patient that says non-compliance with no additional detail as to why the patient didn't follow your instructions. But in ICD-10, there are several codes to describe why a patient is non-compliant in taking drugs prescribed by you. The new clinical terminology is drug underdosing. Underdosing identifies situation in which your patient has taken less of a medication than prescribed by you, either unintentionally or intentionally. Document in your notes why the patient isn't taking the correct amount of their medication and the associated condition. For example, patient was admitted due to acute exacerbation of systolic heart failure. Patient has age-related dementia and forgot to take her digoxin as prescribed. Or patient cut her dose in half this month because of a financial issue. What's new here is that a diagnosis of depression without further qualification is coded to F32.9, which in ICD-10 is a code for major depressive disorder, single episode, unspecified. In ICD-9, a diagnosis of unqualified depression was assigned a code that simply said depression. If your intended diagnosis is something other than major depression, such as a depressive neurosis, anxiety depressive disorder, bipolar disorder with depression, or an adjustment disorder with depression, document this in order to avoid misrepresenting a less severe form of depression as a major depressive disorder. If the patient does have a major depressive order, Consider adding additional details to your documentation about the condition. For example, major depression can be further specified as being a single versus recurrent episode as well as being in partial or full remission. In addition, it can be categorized as a mild, moderate, or severe episode and if severe with or without psychotic features. According to published Medicare inpatient hospital data, the code for unspecified depression appears on one-fifth of hospital records covered by Medicare. We can do a better job of describing what we are treating, which will result in more accurate data to explain treatment, use of resources, medications prescribed, and length of stay.
ICD-9 provided a single code for tobacco abuse and dependence without differentiation and without further specificity for the type of tobacco product. ICD-10 provides separate codes for these. If your intended diagnosis is dependence, dependence is what you should document rather than abuse. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, most smokers are dependent and nicotine dependence is the most common form of dependence in the U.S. Additionally, further specificity is provided for ICD-10 for the type of tobacco product dependence as cigarettes, chewing tobacco, or other, for example, cigars. So this should be documented as well. Your documentation should differentiate between current abuse and dependence versus a person who no longer uses tobacco. Starting in 2002, the number of former smokers has exceeded the number of current smokers. For tobacco dependence, ICD-10 provides the ability to report remission and withdrawal. Examples of nicotine withdrawal symptoms include irritability, anxiety, difficulty concentrating, and increased appetite. ICD-10 also provides the ability to show a cause and effect relationship between tobacco dependence and nicotine-induced disorders when documented. Finally, your notes for a patient's exposure to secondhand smoke can be converted to an ICD-10 code that says exactly that. What's new is that ICD-10 provides codes to indicate exposure to secondhand smoke in utero during the perinatal period and after the perinatal period. The ICD-10 classification system requires that codes for these exposures be reported with all respiratory diagnoses as well as with some conditions of the ears, nose, and throat, for example, otitis media. ICD-10 still provides codes for those routine exams you perform in the office, such as routine medical, gynecologic, healthy child, and newborn exams. There is no patient complaint involved, nor is there a suspected or reported diagnosis with these exams. What's different in ICD-10 for this type of exam is that there are two codes for each exam. One code identifies the encounter as being for a routine exam with no abnormal findings, and the other code identifies an exam that resulted in abnormal findings being present. Take a look on screen at the example of the codes for a routine child health exam with and without abnormal findings. The directive associated with the code for abnormal findings indicates that an additional code for the abnormal finding must be assigned so you will need to make sure that this is documented in your notes as well. ICD-10 requires more detailed descriptions in your documentation of anatomical site, laterality, and aspects of a disease, injury, procedure, and circumstances of patient encounters. The information generated from ICD-10 codes will result in a more accurate picture of your patient's severity of illness and risk of mortality and the services rendered. This in turn will result in accurate public reporting on quality and outcomes. Thanks for joining me. Should you have questions about documentation for a particular diagnosis or procedure, your hospital's clinical documentation improvement specialist should be your first stop. The coding staff in your health information management department is a valuable resource as well. Have a great day.